what we read today, where we go, how we interact with each other, who we interact with, what we buy, what we want, who we want, who we date, who we want to represent us politically, how we want our voices to be heard, who we want to represent us, how our news is delivered. There is not a single aspect of our everyday life untouched by AI. And that means that machine learning and artificial intelligence are parsing this large-scale data that is gathered about us, and decisions are made about who we are and what we want. This data sorts people into categories of inclusion and exclusion. It drives our own expectations and anticipations of what to expect. It parses what's relevant, and it creates new calculated publics of online attention. And yet, when the news and magazines, newspapers cover artificial intelligence, when they show images of what AI is, they use images and stories of a future. Killer robots, jobless futures, cybernetic hybrids, the coming singularity, AI overlords. Society fears the AI of the future, but we're not ready, I would argue, for the AI that we have right now in our everyday lives. Tonight, I want to focus my talk on gender and AI and on the future. Now, by gender, I mean how societies define and manage the categories of human similarities and differences. By gender, I, I mean the cultural definitions, norms and expectations and behaviors. Also, the assumptions about what counts as masculine, what counts as feminine, and the assumptions we make about who men are, who women are, who trans and non-binary people are. It's, it's about how societies define what they value around what people, all people, do. And with AI, I would argue we have a significant gender problem, one that society is not ready for, and one that I fear, without intervention now, will grow worse. So what do I mean? Well... Let's take the kinds of images that advertised this lecture that are advertising the National Science Week here in the Czech Republic. This is what AI looks like in major newspapers and magazines at our industry, at our academic conferences. AI appears with a body, and that body is often shown as female. And it's often, when it's shown as female, it's calming, it's non-threatening, it's blue or white very calm. Um, when it's shown as a, as a digital entity, it's shown as a network or as nodes or it's overlaid on a human brain um, as if, right, we have zeros and ones coursing through our heads. When it's shown with humans, inevitably in these stock images that are used, we have it touched by a hand, right, by its maker, as if it were painted on the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. But notice that maker is almost always a white hand, and it's almost always a man's hand, giving it life, right, touching it like the hand of God. Now, these images are not the reality of what today's AI actually looks like. If I were to show you what AI looks like, it might be a server room. It might be your smartphone. It might be the thousands of people whose labor goes into ensuring that our content is safe and reaches us, that images are labeled and tagged, that our systems actually work. And those are pictures that we don't see when we talk about AI. To talk about the AI of today, we need to address who's represented in that data. 
To talk about AI as beneficial for society, we really have to address the values that are going in to building the AI systems that we have right now. And we need to think about how these systems are shaping our own expectations and experiences of the world. And that really means what I think are uncomfortable conversations, especially when we're talking about engineering and science. There are uncomfortable conversations about the inequality that is increasingly um, coming in the world, not necessarily from the cause of AI, but certainly benefiting the technical development with technologies being developed in one place and the labor that goes into ensuring those systems being done far away from where the compensation is. To answer these kinds of questions, we really need to think about what kind of future we want and how our technological designs of today will become the infrastructure for the future of society. Now, what does this mean practically? It means that today's data is building tomorrow's future. And this has serious implications for equality in society, not just equality for women, but equality for all people. Consider the information that is available that is helping build the training sets and data for today's AI. It's digital information. It's information that's available online. There are three times the number of news articles written about men than there are women. We can chalk that up to old-fashioned news industry and say, well, you know, today's young and the, and the internet. We have more content online. And yet, when we look at Wikipedia, a fabulous independent voice for news and information across the world, the gender gap in the information is actually greater. Nine times the number of articles written about men on Wikipedia than written about women. If we think globally and intersectionally, we see that only 7% of the world's languages are actually represented in published materials. And that kind of figure, too, gets represented online, where on Wikipedia, 84% of the articles are about my home country, the United States, and Europe. So we have an overwhelming um, disproportion of information that is focusing on a few kinds of people in the world. Now, these are figures that come from a global platform open to all to build um, and, and a nonprofit platform. What about the corporate and larger scale information data that is being built now? Well, we simply don't know for much of this because independent researchers don't have access to that information. Now, these existing inequalities in today's information space are becoming intertwined into our emerging technologies, and they're increasingly being relied on for all sorts of social decisions. We're building the future of decision-making in society on these gaps in information that we have today. So to understand AI, I would argue we have to first decouple what we think or imagine is happening and what's actually going on in everyday practice. How many of you would say you have some kind of passing information, um, some kind of passing knowledge about AI? How many, how many sort of technical, you would consider yourself somewhat tech savvy? So that's kind of half the room. That's um, both a little more and a little less than I expected for this le lecture. Um, how many of you think you could give a definition of AI? I'm not going to put you on the spot. Okay, sorry. A definition. Who could who could define AI? A few a few hands. Okay, good. Okay, that gives me a sense of who's in the room. Um, so what experts think will happen 5, 10, 15, 25 years in the future um, is actually quite different from what we're doing today. And it's very different from how we are having public conversations about AI. So consider this definition. It's a definition from 20 years ago, mind you, um, from the AI researcher Tom Mitchell. We say that a machine learns 
a particular task. It has a performance metric. It has a type of experience if the system reliably improves its ex performance at that, at that metric, following a task, following an experience. It's a very narrow definition of what we think of of learning and intelligence. That's the core beginning of how we think about what artificial intelligence is. And yet this really pretty narrow definition, can we measure that a machine's performance gets better at a task when it goes through an experience? That narrow definition now routinely gets put aside as researchers and the public alike give a human form. They give a body to AI. They give a body to this technical definition of intelligence. We hear it in how people talk about the performance of some kinds of AI systems as superhuman, right? So um, Alpha Zero, for example, at DeepMind, creating games, uh, AI systems that can play games, labeling those with superhuman performance, right? I would argue this is leading to what a scholar of Greek tragedy might call hubris. We're setting up a very small, very narrow band of expertise as being super intelligent. What does this hubris look like? Well, the um, AI researcher Stuart Russell has a beautiful metaphor, and I like it because it's um, it's not exactly what he intended. Now, he said it's as if AI researchers are engineers of asphalt. They make asphalt. And they then go around to everyone and say, your beach, you don't need that. We're really good at making asphalt. We are going to pave it. Your garden, your front lawn, your school, you don't need green space. Let's just put pavement down. He uses this metaphor to talk about that kind of hubris, of technical expertise saying to society, trust us, we're going to make the right decisions because we're really, really good at our jobs. We wouldn't trust any other kind of public decision in this respect in any other industry. And yet, what I like about this metaphor is something that I don't think R Russell considered. Asphalt, like AI, becomes a part of infrastructure. Once it gets laid down, it becomes part of how we shape our pathways, where and how we go, who we connect with, what is connected. The development of AI has fundamental ways going forward to change the basic infrastructure of our societies. And right now, it's changing the ways that we know, the, our ways of knowing. Those roads are being paved. And I think they're being paved without a lot of people understanding what the stakes are. They're being paved on our social media. They're being paved in healthcare, banking, finance, criminal justice, public decision-making, security software, military software. In short, this infrastructure, based on data that does not fully represent the world, that has challenges, that's incomplete, is based on very narrow definitions of smart, is routinely being marketed and sold as being better than other kinds of decision-making. This is what I call one of the world's largest ever social experiments. If we talk about AI ethics as the choices of designers, and this is important, we miss how people in their work, in their jobs, at their schools, how people make choices about these technologies in everyday life. Now, I put this picture up. This is actually from a study that I did. This is a, a from a book that I'm working on about large-scale construction. And the short story behind this slide is that 
you know, we, we, we think of construction as a really low tech industry and it is, except there's been a massive push to create new kinds of data infrastructures for the, for the industry. And we've got a lot of lessons to learn for how ordinary everyday construction workers figured out how and when and where to adopt this technology. But I also like this image because um, when we think about the impact of AI on jobs, the image that's been told to us or shown to us is often one about low-skilled manufacturing work. And yet, we have very little data on the differential impact of AI on society when we think in terms of gender. So feminist scholars, this is, this is a bit of a uh, slot, I promise you not a lot of theory, but a very short, give me two minutes on feminist theory. How many of you would say you have some background in feminist theory? See, more than I expected and also less than I expected. Fabulous. So as um, you know, feminist scholars have long critiqued um, that the kinds of jobs or the kinds of work that we do in society um, is is shaped by certain social values, that we have types of activities that need to be done that are undervalued and underpaid. And specifically, I'm thinking of care work, the work we do for our loved ones, for our families, for our parents, for our children, regardless of who we are. That work is vital to society, and yet it's part of the work that gets under-acknowledged. So we can see echoes of how some kinds of work will change in AI and automation. We see echoes of this in the economic data. Um, so we know women are undercounted in economic activity. Um, we know the work of care work is undercounted in economic activity. And yet, when families in the U.S. and Europe are given more time when they become wealthier, one of the first things they do is spend more time on their families, more time in education of their children. As countries get wealthier, people spend more on services, freeing them up to do this kind of care work, this kind of work of love. And yet, in our conversations about AI and the future of work, we've really failed to talk about how care work will become part of that conversation. We've really focused on what's been going on in traditionally male-dominated industries. So there's simply too much that we don't yet know. Will AI damage women standing in the workplace and in the economy? We have very little evidence. Will job hiring algorithms be biased against women? The emerging evidence suggests they will. Will communication tracking software like email and sales coaching software be biased against women's styles of work? Maybe. We don't yet have great evidence on that. Will news, the new sort of skills of AI require more or less of the soft touch skills of communication? That is, will humans need to be more creative and will human creativity and communication and interpersonal relations, will that be more valued? Again, we don't know. There are, there's conflicting evidence in the economic analysis. In short, there's so much that we don't know, and yet the development and the rollout of technologies in workplaces is continuing at full speed ahead. So here's what we do know. Um, this past year, the... Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom released a report that looked at tasks at work. Now, this comes for those of you who know the Frey and Osborne methodology, my, my colleagues at Oxford. Um, they said, when we think about the impact of AI and jobs, let's not think about job like professor. Let's think about the tasks that professors do, like marking papers, marking exams. And let's think about what percentages of jobs, what percentages of certain kinds of tasks are in each job. And then we can measure jobs. The good news is, for now, they say, professors have a lot of kinds of tasks that can't be easily automated. So, the, let's hope. 
Thank you. Let's hope that my job can't be automated. Um, however, there may be parts of my job I want automated. If I could automate marking exams, yes, please. I happily give up that part of my job. Um, so this year, the Office of National Statistics in the UK did an analysis taking building on that. And they basically said, let's come up with a, a subtle differential analysis of who's at the most risk for automation. So whose jobs have the highest percentage of those tasks that we think are likely to become automated. The highest risk jobs, women hold 70% of the jobs with the greatest risk of automation. So this is completely flipped from some of our images that we have about AI taking over factories. It's AI taking over checkout lines, banking, services, retail, multiple kinds of positions where we haven't thought of those jobs as being vulnerable to the embodied robots. Literally, our image of the robotic arm is harming us from being able to see these kinds of other applications of AI. Who else is at risk? I hate to say younger people are at risk. So people between the ages of 30 to 39, how many in the room would consider yourself, you don't really have to answer, but how many in, in here would be in your 30s? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So in your 30s, in your 30, people in their 30s face some protection from automation. You're, you're established enough after your university degree to have some more interesting work, um, less routine things in your in your in your work, and then and then afterwards, um, there's a little less protection in the 40s and 50s. There's a little less protection from that. So, what happens between the ages of 30 and 39 for women in the workforce? Well, this wonderful graph shows exactly. The gap of the 30s is exactly when women take breaks from the workforce. We have lower, it's the time of the least participation in workforce in the UK, the least participation of women in the workforce. Women take a break from the workforce to do that work of care labor. And so the, the gap between the workforce participation um, lessens as people get older and it's and it's and it's less. Uh, before the 30s. So exactly at the moment when jobs have the most protection from automation in the life course is exactly when women are out of the workforce. So speaking of women, um, these images that we have of women robots and women in society are deeply shaping how we think about and prepare for the AI of now. These images of AI that we see are shaping this kind of future. This picture on the top left, that's someone's image of online support, right? A very highly sexualized robot. Now, this, these all came, these were the top searches. They're silly, but they're the top searches from a very popular online stock photography and stock image source. And this is what photographers are cover. This is what uh, news editors are, are using when they cover AI. But where do these images come from? Well, if we look at how AI has been covered in our popular press, if you take se the 77 characters from the start of Metropolis, Fritz Lang's amazing 1929 film, to Ex Machina, only three of those 77 characters had no gender. So I can stand here and tell you all you want that the AI making your um, recommendations on face, your Facebook newsfeed is a gender neutral thing, except every image we have in our popular imagination has coded AI as either male or female. It'll be no surprise that when AI is shown in a movie as being sexy, only women are sexy, women robots. But when AI is shown as being powerful or strong, it's often male. So 
again, why should it matter that science fiction um, is changing, you know, that, that we have these images from science fiction? Um, unfortunately, it's coloring how people talk about artificial intelligence. The, um, the company Live Person, which makes an AI-enabled personal assistant, did a survey of my country people, of Americans, 1,000 American um, consumers, 8.3%. So 8.3% of Americans said they could name a female leader in technology. Now, when they asked the follow-up question and they said, okay, name her, only half said they could. Only actually half of that. So only 4% of Americans could actually name a woman leader in tech. A quarter of those respondents named Alexa and Siri as women in tech. Now, it's funny. It really is funny. But half of all respondents, so 500 people, could name Bill or Steve or Mark. My only saving grace is that Jeff Bezos was not in the top list of American men in tech. Now, it's a small thing, and yet it's very large. We're at a time when we've had an enormous expansion of, women, of jobs in, political, um, in computer science, and yet the percentage of women in the United States studying computer science is now half of what it was in 1984. We've seen a drop, a precipitous drop in the number of women studying computer science. When we look at AI research and AI leadership, we see that that's even smaller than computer science in general. With 18% of the registrations at the global conference, the global leading conference in AI, um, NeurIPS, uh, being women. So this is devastating. We have, we have these challenges of AI, and in the last slides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed us through kind of the, the challenges that we face. Um, we have this, a challenge of AI that we're building an infrastructure that is devastating for the knowledge generated about and by women. Um, I'm going to run a quick demo. Who in here speaks Hungarian? Somebody speaks Hungarian, please. Yo de kavanot. No, I have no Hungarians in here. Good. Um, because my Hungarian is terrible. Um... So I, I don't expect you can see this in the back. This is a list of job titles. And in Hungarian, there is no gendered pronoun. You may know this, right? I would say this person, that person is, right? There's no, there's no he or she in Hungarian. So what happens when it is, it is brought into... Um, Google Translate. Now, Google Translate's a fabulous example of natural language processing, of the kinds of um, uh, things that have happened, the incredible advances in machine translation. So I'm going to take that list, and I'm just going to paste it in here. And it happens almost every time. So we have two, we have three, uh, and changes every time, right? This is a live translation. So gender neutral titles next to, next to, um, she is a babysitter. She is a nurse. She's a primary school teacher. And that's it. Now, this is a persistent finding in machine translation across gender neutral into gendered languages like English and I assume Czech as well. 18 different languages, uh, Predis and his co-authors last year in a paper they published on Archive, 18 different languages have this kind of bias that we can't quite explain based on the number of women who work in these occupations based on information that we have. There's something persistent. Now, I know enough about Hungarian to know to look for this problem, but if you don't, you might be seeing an erasure of the kinds of people and representation that we have. So we also have other kinds of inequalities. I'll walk you through them very briefly. Um, 
This is from the kinds of harms that we can have from algorithmic decision making. Again, hiring, employment, insurance and social benefits, housing, education. We have these categories of the potential loss of opportunity, potential economic loss, and potential social stigmatization that happen. And again, these are not even in when we're looking at life and death decisions being made in automated healthcare decisions or decisions that might cause harm. Gender Shades, a project that's been written about in newspapers around the world, found that the error rates in commercially available facial recognition systems ranged for women with dark skin between 20 and 34 percent, where the error rates for men with light skin compared to the, the error rates for men with light skin. That is, if you were to show these systems a woman with dark skin, um, it was only better than, slightly better than a coin toss if they could actually appropriately identify them. Whereas for the men, they, they range from about 95 to 99%. So here's what we need. We need, I would argue, new stories about AI. We need to have new and better insights into what we are working with in terms of society. We need to think about the social implications of the tech that we're building today, and we need much more work at that interface between the so social and the technical. And finally, we need to be able to build systems that have the power to contest, where people can actually be involved in um, holding their, the data about them accountable for the decisions about their lives. In terms of gendered knowledge, we have to remember that the amplification of these small differences in data, they get amplified through technically inflexible but seemingly responsive systems. That the systems of today are not the Terminator future general AI of the future, but they're relatively fixed, and yet we're assuming that they have more flexibility than they are. We need to understand the limits of technical solutions to the problem of social bias, and we need to be able to build our, our technologies to account for that. We need to understand the growing gulf between the people who are designing and deploying these systems versus the rest of us who are using them and will be affected by them. We need new data and new inputs, and we need to understand that this will often come at a cost in workplaces a cost that we need to design our workplaces for. And then we need to recognize the limits to data-driven solutions to social and political problems and really address that hubris of the technological drive to, to create technical solutions to social problems. And with that, I would like to open it back up to questions from you, and I would love to be able to hear from you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for the inspiring uh, talk. Um, my question would be, now there are many like working groups on the level of European Commission, OECD, uh, United Nations, etc., on AI and ethics. Do you think they do address enough the, the issue of gender and AI? Thank you. Um, to um, so are we doing enough to address gender and AI? No, I don't think we're doing enough to address inequality in AI. The AI ethics conversation to date has been important, but it has primarily been aimed at technology designers and tech companies. What do, what do policymakers need to do to hold tech companies responsible? And how can we encourage technology companies to be responsible? Fine, except we're talking about technologies that will be in everybody's everyday life. How many of you have ever used Google Translate? Right, you don't need to be an engineer at Google in order to use Google Translate. And yet, having some kinds of contextual information about where the data are coming from can help us make better choices about when and how to rely on those. It's great if I want to 
learn to say hello in Czech, it might not be great if I'm relying on representing important concepts about, about social equality. Well, this is actually a follow-up on that because I did my PhD in artificial intelligence and namely natural language processing. So here at MATFIS, at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics, which has actually a huge problem with the women in computer science, but that's another story. That makes it um, a very typical department. <laughs> Sorry to hear that, but it's still true. On the other hand, we still we cooperate with Chiquitas, which is you probably heard about that, uh, uh, that movement. Anyway... Uh, I also see uh, probably two problems connected to um, the gender in chatbots, which I mostly work with, and it's the purpose and also grammar, as you've already shown a bit. But uh, for us, when implementing a chatbot, it's still much easier to uh, do it with uh, kind of a neutral or uh, male endings in Czech, so that's one of the reasons. And the second, because I also work for a technological company that implements chatbots and stuff, uh, the clients very often uh, want the, the chatbot to be a male because, and it's namely, it's, it's mostly banking, they consider them to be more trustworthy. Now the question is, why is that so? It will, will exa I mean, you've just wonderfully made my, my point for me, right? That when we, um, unfortunately, we have a problem in society of accepting the expertise of women. And so we are coding um, chatbots that give expertise as male, but chatbots and um, voice-activated agents that give assistance as female. And this is persistent across the industry. It's becoming a convention. And it's not a convention that has to be that way. And yet, you know, we're, we're reinforcing it with every kind of loop, right? Um, we are creating those feedback loops. And, and, it's, and it's true. So just to talk, the challenge, I don't envy um, natural language processing professors because, um, or researchers, because they, it is one of the hardest things that we do, right? We as humans understand context. You understand I'm speaking in a context of a professional lecture, which is very different than when I speak to my children or speak to my friends. Uh, so, so getting that context right is actually one of the hardest challenges that we have in language. Um, one automated response, um, so, you know, these kinds of automated responses that you can get to email, right? If you use Gmail, you've noticed that Gmail has started to give these automated responses. Google can't solve the problem of gender. So, um, great, I saw him yesterday, will never be one of the responses because they can't, they can't get the gender of the object um, right in, in responding. So they've decided to, to make the responses shorter, and that will change how we communicate and email to one another. The other thing that they can't do is get the comments right. There are some comments that we use a lot in our, in our correspondence, but when they're in the wrong context, they're fatal. So for example, um, most people use their email the most frequently to their loved ones, and they might sign off, I might sign off with a little X and O or a love, but not to my graduate students, right? I would not, that's, that's a context that's incredibly important. And so we know that language is so deeply contextual that that's going to be one of the hardest problems in NLP. It is. Pragmatics as such. Thank you. We, all, we also have some questions on Slido, so I'm going to read one of them. Uh, how AI is perceived is also influenced by the porn industry, quite leading the progress in this area. Maybe that also also shapes the female perception of AI images, which is the question. Which industry? The uh, porn? Porn industry? Oh, um, uh, oh uh, listen, I absolutely. I mean, technology gets rolled out first. Every new technology gets rolled out pretty quickly in some kind of um, sex uh, activity. So we saw it with the World Wide Web, the commercial internet, the rise of the commercial internet. I, that was the, my first book. Um, many of the people that I interviewed as, as early pioneers of the commercial internet, they had side 
jobs working in online porn. Um, yeah. So we have kind of a, a volatile situation. I mean, in some ways it's a bit of a, a joke question, but it's also incredibly important. Um, the representation of sex and sexuality actually does shape how the technology becomes used and rolled out. So we, we too have images and, and real work being done on sex robots. Um, when we have lots of other things we also need to be working on. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, we create the world. I, so I don't think that we necessarily create it. We are copy pasting it from today's world, pretty much. So it's not something new. It's something that we are very aware of. Well, some of us at least. Uh, now, my problem here is that I as a female, somebody that takes part in the digital world today, I'm giving information and I'm feeding technology com companies with that information. So as a, and knowing that 90% uh, of women around the world, let's say, are, or users of internet are pretty much in the same level as a man, um, we are actually the one building it. Mm -hmm. So how do we change it? Because for me, basic education is actually where the problem starts. So family, school, and then up. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily the moment of high education that we should ad address, but rather start from early age. I absolutely um, agree that we have to, so it's a, it's a two pronged problem, right? One problem is the problem of inequality in society. And that's not something that simply has a quick technical fix. I think we have to recognize that the speed and pace of um, AI development means that we're creating kinds of infrastructures that will be hard to question and contest unless we get involved now. So that's where I think the urgency comes from. And I absolutely agree with you that we're um, we're trying to build the systems for a society of the future based on not even the copy and paste from today, but a copy and a paste of a, of a, of a distorted reflection of today, right? Of data systems. One of the, um, great places to do, um, tread natural language process training for systems in conversational English, conversational American English, is the site Reddit. And yet, Reddit, we know, has problems, enormous problems with gender representation, with um, gender con concepts of how people are being discussed. So what do we do about it? I think we do a couple of things. We need to have more people aware and engaged and thinking about and pushing for fairer and just systems. And again, not just the technology companies, but ordinary everyday people. Second, I think we need to absolutely have public conversation about the role of our data and how our data is being used and what it's being used for. And we need to be able to begin a conversation about public sources of knowledge, how our governments how our, how our um, trusted academic institutions can begin to build kinds of knowledge that isn't based on discriminatory systems and patterns. And I think that that's, that's only a start, but that's where I would, I would begin to start. And one more thing, if you, uh, the data that you have on Wikipedia, do you by any chance know how many writers of Wikipedia articles are men and how many women? Because I would like to compare that as well. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't have that on, um, off the top of my head, but I think you're right. There are, we know there are more men participating on Wikipedia than women. There are wonderful projects. There's Visible Wiki Women, which is a project to help get more photographs of women onto Wikipedia. Um, and, um, a project called Who's Knowledge, which is trying to get more knowledge about more places globally online and represented. So we don't have these kinds of data shadows um, that are leading to some incredible inequalities globally. So yes, I think that that's one of the, one of the places to begin to start. Is there anyone else who would like to ask?
Hello, uh, maybe I have a stupid question, but uh, do you have any practical advice for the chatbot creators? How how should we solve the gender problem? Should we like toss a coin every time when we decide that we want to create a new chatbot or something like that? I'm going to borrow um, Justine Cassell's um, response. So Justine C Chris Cassell is a social computing um, uh, expert at Carnegie Mellon. And she, along with the CEO of Live Person, has been involved in an AI and gender uh, initiative in part to address some of these questions around how we do social computing in a chatbot-driven world. And she basically said, what's up with gender and chatbots? Why is it that we need to be building chatbots that everyone thinks is using the metaphor of human? They're, they're not human, right? So why are we assuming and ascribing that they are um, acting as human? So she recommends, can we come up with... Um, silly gender neutral ways you know maybe they're maybe maybe the the um, chatbot is in the form of an alien maybe it's in in the form of the company logo maybe it's something that isn't necessarily trying to pass as male or female it's true that it's hard in language right but again think about the contextual information that we're having right now we're having a major social conversation around what kinds of forms of address people want and if someone wants a form of address that doesn't match how i might be perceiving their gender we're starting to get a conversation that says well they're entitled to ask to be called by the pronoun they want to be called by Why couldn't we do that in chatbots? Why couldn't we say, hello, welcome here today. H how should I refer to you? Um, because that's, again, a conversation that we're beginning to have in more and different kinds of areas. Yeah, I believe that your like, suggestion would work in a text uh, chatbots. But how about voice chatbots? Because we need to decide, yes. like, would it be like male voice or female voice? I know that there were some like uh, tries to make some gender neutral voice, but it wasn't working that great. Yeah, embodied voice is very difficult. Nass and Reeves, um, two researchers from Stanford, have actually looked at this and they said, you know what people want, um, what they really, really want when they have embodied voice is they want to hear their own kind of emotional stance repeated back to them. So in some cases, we're making choices around voice um, chat that is You know, women provide assistance, men provide expertise. Well, what if we flipped that? Not a necessarily a flip of a coin, but we flipped that ever so, you know, ever so much and said, you know, when we need to provide a calm situation, perhaps in, say, um, navigation, that we're going to, to mirror um, that. Or we're going to give user choice, right? We're going we're to provide user choice. It's a, hard, it's a hard question. But right now, I think the convention is unfortunately becoming um, reinforcing the idea that women are to assist the male experts. I would like to go back to what the lady asked, and it was about uh, like female um, programmers, female producers. I'm from a telco company, and what we are trying is to get more female inside with the, with the idea that if uh, th they will be mirroring the client base, they will be also producing more like female friendly, whatever, yeah, uh, from, I don't know, smartwatches to uh, chatbots. Uh, so I would like to, to hear your opinion on that, if really that's also the way how to get. And then and another, just to share the experience, what you said uh, before about like uh, really trying to work with the policymakers on on this uh, um, AI and gender. And I would like to, to share an experience. There is a uh, governmental committee, no, there's a committee uh, to the government of human rights. And just recently there was created a group called Technology and Human Rights uh, that is now analyzing all these kind of strategies that have been produced in last years, like the Digital Czech Republic 2000, I don't know what it was, the innovation strategy, the AI strategy, whatever. And you see that this was made, all these strategies, without this kind of point of view, not only uh, human rights, but I think also like gender diversity and equality, et cetera. So what to do? I mean, we are coming late. Uh, now, fortunately, it seems that there's still a period to change some of these uh, strategies. But what to do in these cases? I mean, have you seen some other international examples how to reverse that? 
Fortunately, you have a fabulous um, international leader here in Prague um, with the Gender and Science Initiative um, that you have the kind of calls for analysis both of women's participation in, in research and innovation, but also of gender and social impact of the kinds of policies that are being created and of the kinds of technologies that are being created. So um, I think it's twofold, right, that, that we have to increase um, the number of kinds of uh, people who are participating, but we also need to be able to do the analysis to show the impact. For example, um, the European Union high-level expert group on AI released a, uh, about 18 months ago, released a set of principles on AI principles. They don't mention work and workers once. Actually, that's not true. They mention work once, and it is as, of a, workers as a kind of a stakeholder for AI. It's an example, right? They don't even say we need to, we need to have ethical AI because it benefits people in their workplaces. That's a pretty low bar to set. And yet that's a bar that hasn't been set by the highest level of AI ethics. So when we're having conversations about ethics, we've had a very technical, very high level conversation and we're not looking at the pragmatics of how people in their everyday lives are going to be using technologies. So now to who's going to do that work. Absolutely, we need more women and we need more diverse people working in tech. And by working in tech, I don't mean simply working as programmers. I think we redefine what it is to be technical by looking at all of those types of jobs. And I am very proud to be at the Oxford Internet Institute where we really are pushing to get more people from around the world involved in these kinds of conversations. And so when you open up and you say that to be in tech isn't simply to be writing the, the cutting edge AI systems and programs, but it is about Who's helping with the sales? Who's helping with the communication? Who's helping with the marketing? Who's helping with the strategy? Who's helping with the leadership? Who's helping with the research? There's so many kinds of roles. And if we can recast those roles as core and fundamental to the building of safe and effective technology, then I think we can change the world. I hope you're right on the other hand. <laughs> My first job uh, as a programming was pretty tough in this uh, case because I've heard many times like from neck down, you're fine. By the, the, I was actually leading the, the uh, team of developers and it's still, then it's difficult to get some more girls to Matfis, for instance, and other faculties because there is still this label and I'm still sometimes perceived as someone kind of Weird, I would say. But uh, uh, back to the Wikipedia issue, uh, there's been a uh, talk on um, at the conference called New Media Inspiration only recently, and the speaker uh, also pointed out that historically there were more, uh, let's say, influential men than women. So that also kind of an explanation for, for this disproportion. And uh, back to uh, the chatbot questions, I would uh, probably again emphasize the purpose because the very first research I did on or uh, implementation of chatbot was actually a sex bot. And uh, we all probably know that every artificial intelligence is as good as the training data. And the problem was that we had lots of training data from the sex chats. And that's uh, how we were able to, well, probably we also added to this um, um, perceiving gen um, females as something like assistants. And that was actually a purpose because based on the training data, we were supposed to create sex bots that would help out the, the people with some special sexual needs or fantasies to rather talk to artificial intelligence than go out and behave inappropriately. And uh, there's also another um, uh, thing connected to um, the, not the text bots, but the, the spoken um, or uh, speech bots. Um, and it's uh, 
that the Turing test was actually the first time it was overcome uh, by the team of Dan Jurafsky at the Stanford University. And that was the research that was also done on the hotlines because they had hotline data uh, and they were actually able to fake the arousal in the chatbot. And the respondents first said, part of them first said that uh, they actually got turned on by the computer more likely than the real human. So here we are. There is a wonderful book, um, very clearly written, called Artificial Intelligence by Meredith Broussard at MIT Press. And she's a computational journalist. So a journalist who builds her own neural nets, um, very simple machine learning uh, models as well. Um, she's she's got a journalist's gift for telling stories and for explaining to the public about um, a, a complex topic. And she tells these amazing stories of the founders of AI and how deeply, deeply antisocial they were. Um, you know, she tells the story of Marvin Minsky, not, not considered one of the fathers of modern AI, um, not, you know, not, not being able to really function in everyday life and having his, you know, wife and daughters basically care for him in these, you know, very simple ways that the rest of us would find, um, normal. That, that we've built up a, a myth of what technology is by, you know, essentially having a, a fairly isolated group of, um, people who who have a very particular worldview and then trying to make that into that image. So yes, I mean, the idea that you have corp a, a very large corpus of data, great, let's go and, and, and play with that without the consequences of saying, well, is this actually the kind of AI research that we need? Like, is this what we, is this what we, is this going to help make society a better place? Um, yeah, and I don't know that that's an answer to your question, but... Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? If not, I would ask a question. Uh, you have mentioned that more often than not, the AI systems look like women. And I couldn't not notice that they often look like very sexualized women. And why do you think that is so? And what do you think about it? So um, Broussard in Artificial Unintelligence points out that we've had this group of researchers who even compared to um, computer scientists in general have, have been more enthralled and enchanted of science fiction and of creating a kind of alternative um, future. And so the idea that we might be building... Um, kinds of technologies that simply reflect a very small slice of society um, should worry us all. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter like who that is, right? We've got a very, it's not, it's not being built on principles of uh, reflecting society. It's not been being built on principles of how to develop or expand or grow society. It's, it's being built on, well, what do I think looks cool? Well, if you're a very small and homogenous group um, that has a pretty narrow view of what, what society looks like, then what you think is cool may not be what I think is cool. And I mean cool in both sense. I know I've just used an English slang, right? What's cool is in trendy versus what's cool as in like politically okay. It's just not okay to be building out these kinds of images. Um, I, um, in Oxford, we recently, um, had an art gallery that had the world's first AI artist and she was called Ada, which is a pun on Ada Lovelace, um, who's co considered one of the world's first computer programmers, uh, but it was spelled A-I-D-A. And, uh, have any of you heard about Ada, the art making robot? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what is fabulous and terrifying about Ada is um, she, she, right, if you're going to make an art robot, it's going to be a, an attractive woman, of course, because that's what artists look like, didn't you know? 
Um, so she's made as an attractive woman. She has, um, she looks very nice from the head down, right? She has a, she has a very highly sexual body because of course that's how artists always present themselves. And what's fascinating from an AI point of view is of course there's a bit of, um, machine vision going on and there is some representation and there's some, um, there is some um, GANs. There's some. There's some adversarial AI. I mean, there's some. There's some. There's some kind of neat technical things going on underneath the surface. Except when Ada gives an artist's interview, there's literally a woman sitting in another room giving the answers. So they have created an embodied robot to show this technology. However, there's literally women fueling the image, right? There's literal, literal women who are being the voice of this, of this so-called AI. It, it just shows, I think, so much of the problem that we have in terms of thinking about what is the role of women in society? What is the role of women in tech? How might we show, how could we be showing or using um, some kind of thing? This was simply a, 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 in some ways, a gimmick for an art gallery. And yet it does real damage to how we th want to think about what serious um, technical infrastructure for the future of society might look like. So if I may, um, I wanted to ask about the role of uh, the corporate sector. I mean, a lot of, lot of the issues that we're facing have to do with the fact that we don't know how the algorithms uh, are done, what feeds them. Uh, because it's, it's private property, uh, it's corporate uh, property. And uh, it's very difficult to regulate. Uh, so one question is, uh, what is the role of um, the public sector and how to hold corporations accountable? Um, second, do you see any difference in the tech companies in how they uh, approach uh, their social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis AI. And then, last question, sorry, these are three. Um, I mean, we are now using technologies, for example, in smart homes that, you know, we, I mean, it can be abused. For example, domestic uh, violence. I mean, no one would have thought that you will install a smart home and it will be used as, a, as an instrument of, of violence against the partner. So do do corporations and can we hold them accountable to ensuring that, for example, this cannot happen or that the partner who is subject to violence can regain control of the system? That's such a great question. I have a student working on a PhD on that right now. And we have just put out a project to do feminist cybersecurity with respect to how we might get citizen participation in those conversations. So for example, I'm sure everybody in this room uses a password manager, right? H show of hands, how many of you use a password manager for your passwords? Yeah, exactly. Now this is cybersecurity 101. Everyone's told we need to be using password managers that use really tough passwords and we don't do it. But yet, if I were to ask each and every one of you, what threats to your own information and security do you see are important? I promise you, you would come up with a list that's more complex and interesting than how we do the threat modeling in cybersecurity. And so if we take the position of women, for example, in society, and we ask women, women who are you afraid of if they get your information? Headlines in my home country are about women politicians who know that abusive partners will use photographic images. This is a, a we just had a, a, congr a congresswoman have to resign because of revenge porn. So we know that there are these discrepancies in society between what you think are the threats, what we think are the threats, and how the threats are being modeled within companies. And that's not, a, that's not about corporate power. That's simply about who's at the table and whose voices 
are able to be heard and saying what's important and what matters. And that's where I think we can have a real impact, right? We can help improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the safety of our technical environments. So that's one. Um, the second is, can we hold these companies accountable? We absolutely need regulation, right? And this is where we need to be very careful because all the technology companies, all the big technology companies are saying, trust us, we'll handle it. Oh, this is so complicated. You could never understand this. I'm sorry, little people, but we are the experts. And there's no way you can ever get it right. And we're seeing that in our elections. We're seeing that in our social media data. We are seeing that in our AI healthcare data. We're seeing it time and again, a kind of paternalism from large tech companies saying, you simply don't have the means to understand it, to which we as citizens can say, show us, teach us, give us the data. No, really, if you're going to use our data, we need to be able to contest the decisions made about us. We need to be able to hold that data accountable, and we need to be able to understand and have some kind of explanation about decisions that are made. Let me slightly disagree, okay? <laughs> and also with the lady, because I'm a corporate, yeah? And in, in fact, I, I do represent the second biggest telco in the world. So it's, it's not that they are not all trying. The trouble is, uh, uh, if we are in discussions, is that neither the society or the academy knows. So the example I told you because of the tech and, digit, uh, and human rights, in fact, we pushed that to be created because we didn't have the answers and we don't have the guidance. And we understand it's not just we are producing technology, but it has to be the academy, it has to be the society and the regulators who are uh, giving the, the guidance and there is no guidance. So uh, it's, it's not easy from the other side as well. I mean, there is a demand, we are developing and, and you are like, hey, will you tell me, I mean, what's the danger? Uh, can, you, can you measure the social impact? And you don't get, get answers. So my, my, for example, the experience I have from this uh, human rights and tech uh, group is slightly frustrating because you would expect I go and I, I get the answers from, from the society, the think tanks and academics, and you are building that in the group, which is wonderful, it's fine. But I mean, you can't expect the others to be more enlightened. They are not, they are on the same level as you are. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I do think policymaker, policymakers in particular are on the back foot. Um, we see a conversation around facial recognition. Some country, some companies, for example, have set, have looked to policymakers saying, we need clearer guidance here because we've got a tool. We trust ourselves to build it, but unless we have some guardrails put in place, we don't know what the limits are. And what we're, so I'm going to take and play out this example on facial recognition, for example. So right now, it, facial recognition is being used in um, the New York City Police Department. 8,000 cases, by the way, have been used by facial recognition systems in New York City alone in their police department. And generally, these are about um, taking an image captured from surveillance footage and running it through databases and getting matches, right? So fast forward to a paper that a group of researchers at Georgetown Law just released this spring. Essentially, what they argued is that the commercial providers of the tools say, here's the tool, here's how you use it properly. And yet, when you go and you look in practice at what the police are actually doing, they use it in ways that's wrong. Now, that might not matter if it's, you know, us using Google Translate to make a funny joke. It really matters if the wrong person is getting arrested and faces um, different kinds of bias because they have that mark on their record. So the things that they were doing is they would take a lookalike, they would look at a photograph and they wouldn't get a match on a facial recognition system through their database. So they would, they would run through a photograph of an actor, of a famous actor who looked like that person saying, well, they look alike. And that let's go see what the facial recognition says and, and see if they return any matches. And yet that's technically how we appear, how something appears to us is not how facial recognition works, right? It's through a set of mathematical um, proportions. 
And so that match is being done on very different kinds of things. We have to be addressing how these technologies are used in practice and not stay working on this very high level, just on this very high level of a theoretical, philosophical level. Wait. But this is, again, something done by government. Exactly. So the regulation you know, for the technology companies, if government is already doing it, what, does, what difference does it make in this case? Who is there to say that government will really protect us if they are actually abusing the technology just to get the case solved because everybody is running for performance, right? Right. And th so this is what we've, we as engaged and active people need to be understanding. We need to understand our data landscape. We need to understand how these systems are being built. We need to understand how they're being used in our own everyday lives. We need to understand what our levers are for action. And so, for example, in this case of, George, of the Georgetown Law Paper, it was using the tools of asking through freedom of information requests to find out about the cases and, and, and what happened in those cases to build a comparison of those examples. We need more examples from more different kinds of countries, right? Many of the examples we have of emerging AI harm and bias are from the United States. And I'm sorry, but that's simply not going to work in a world where we know that translation problems in bringing certain kinds of AI tools into local markets, local markets as big as the one that is represented in this room, that, that we, we need to absolutely be asking these kinds of questions. We need to ask who's behind what kinds of technologies, how those technologies are being used, and when and how that we can actually make some kind of intervention in them. We have one more question on Slido, which is a little broad, so I hope I'm going to interpret it uh, well. And the question is, what can we all do today as individuals, and I presume what can we do to reduce gender bias in artificial intelligence? Step one, get involved, participate more in the conversations in the future in building out better technology, in educating yourselves, your friends, your family. Um, step two is, I think, be aware of how these tools and technologies are being built and and understand their limits so you can be able to preserve the idea of what is and isn't um, uh, a superhuman intelligence, right? If you now know this one small thing about machine translation having a very tough time with context and gender in language, you now can have a bit of information that you're not relying on automatically translated information and materials as being the definitive truth. And being able to question um, those kinds of, of decisions and those kinds of things make you better consumers and users of AI technologies. And finally, I think work to preserve the kind of human autonomy, creativity, and empowerment that we know we need to build fair, just, and equitable societies. So if you want a future for democracy and society, you need to be participating in those conversations right now. That's a really broad broad charge, but I think it's one that we're all capable of. Sorry, so I will have one question that, <laughs> well, let's see how it resonates with what you just said. Um, when I try to explain why it's important to address gender and racial bias in AI uh, to one academic, uh, the answer he gave me is, why should we bother? the world is biased, and so trying to fix AI is social engineering. So how would yes. you... How would I respond to respond social engineering? To so so um, uh, one variant of that question is, um, well, what's new here, right? We have, we have bias in the world, so why should we care about bias in our AI systems? The challenge is the speed, the scope, 
the scale and the pervasiveness of these systems. So when I say that these are becoming infrastructure, take for instance, the facial, the commercial facial recognition packages that are already out and available. You can, you can, that you have used that you use every day when you use um, social media. Those systems are built on a set of training data that is so far removed from you and your experience and your everyday life. And yet teasing out those roots and those connections is very tough for any individual user to do. The kinds of ecosystems that it takes to build, train, deploy, continue to maintain these systems is enormous. And yet, so that's the scope, right? These are enormous world globe spanning systems. And yet, um, we have not seen anything like it in terms of the speed of development. If you think the conversations that we've been having about manipulation of social media around elections is frightening, Wait until we're talking about manipulation in our healthcare data, manipulation in our public data, our smart cities data, our traffic data, manipulation in every aspect of information about our lives. That is what is at stake. So it's not simply that there's some bias and it gets, you know, maybe built into the system. We are building an infrastructure that is not secure and it is being built on shaky foundations we need to be very careful about the kinds of structures we want to build our future society. And that's why we've got to be worried about bias in AI data. Mm. I was wondering, I didn't see the research before when you showed that the, the face recognition worked better for white men than for black w women. So I think that's like a data issue because there is certainly more white men that are famous than black women. So how would you, I, I think like if you had the data, the issue would be solved. So how would you handle it? Would you like give the AI less data for black men, but for white men, but then I think it will be worse. The, the performance would go down. So how to do that? That's a great question because there's actually an answer from the experience. So this is research that was done by an Oxford graduate, Joy Bumalami and Timit Gebru, who um, are two of um, quite recognized um, African Americans in AI. And um, this is Gender Shades, the Gender Shades project. And it was one of Joy's um, projects at MIT, uh, where she's a doctoral student. And for this project, um, and you can read more about it on, I think it's gendershades.org. She has a wonderful video where she explains the, the project. For this project, she took pictures of parliamentarians, so these are government leaders, and ran them through commercially available um, facial recognition systems, um, including ones by Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft. And the first stop was IBM because IBM has a, uh, their AI research lab is literally next door from, from MIT. And um, so Joy went to, to, to IBM and said, hey, look, um, you're among the, they were the, among the worst performing, I think they were at 64% of miscategorizing women with dark skin. Um, you've got a problem with your, with your algorithm. IBM fixed it. I mean, they literally, they were like, okay, we can, we can solve this problem. That's not such a hard problem to solve. We can fix this problem and they fixed it. We saw improvements after the publishing of this paper, we saw improvements in the other systems that she audited, except for one. And it's one of the most commonly used one. Amazon, their response was to attack her and attack her research. It made front page of the New York Times, where the company basically said, yeah, that's not how our, our system actually works. You've misaudited audited it. The problem is with your study. Our data are just fine. Um, and go away, little graduate student. We don't want to have anything to do with you. I mean, literally, that was the level of their corporate response. So um, the story shows, I think, a couple of things. Not that the problem doesn't have a fix. It, 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 in this case, it, it did, right? 
create better training data, understand how to how to how to um, uh, modify the systems, and you got they got better improvement over time. The story is, it took an outside auditor calling attention to the differential rates that these systems performed at on the same training on the same um, set of data. Again, drawn from leaders from countries around the world, right? This wasn't, these weren't just sort of ordinary people. These were people with their pictures published as parliamentarians from um, both Nordic countries and African countries. So the challenge I think here is that we need to create better systems for contesting when there are mistakes and challenges and create more people who are willing and able to test out how their own um, AI uh, parsed information is being presented to them. It's through those kinds of everyday ex uh, experiments that we get more people involved in building better science and we get more people involved in actually creating the kinds of um, addressing some of the blind spots that we know we have in technology development. Yeah, there's an amazing, I'll repeat that for the recording, there's an amazing TED talk as well. Yeah, she's she's quite a phenomenon. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure how, if this is related to AI, but I was wondering, I'm in high school and we were watching this um, maybe nowadays issue deep fakes and, and what you think about them if they, uh, and I'm not sure if only they would be against maybe women, but certain groups, or if you think they would be malicious, maybe in like journalism or or certain parts of of deep fakes. What are we going to do about deep fakes? Um, so we've known for quite a long time that new kinds of media are always used to influence, persuade, and create um, what we might call propaganda. Again, not for me as an American to come to other countries and say, um, look, there's propaganda, because we know countries create and make um, messages that serve and advance their purpose and often can do it in ways that's manipulative, that's not transparent, that's not in keeping with democracy. So uh, the problem with deep fakes, I think there's a technical issue that we're getting much and and better um, at generating kinds of images from computer generated uh, imagery. Oh wait, if it's called CGI, if it's in our cinema, somehow we're not we're not so afraid of what's happening. The very name deep fake is one that is a label where there's a kind of information that's being presented to us as true or real or documentary, and yet is actually deeply, is manipulated. So, so I think there's a two-pronged approach, right? We have right now an intense conversation about trust in society. We're having an intense conversation about what it means to create um, a sort of information environment in which we are furthering and bettering um, the ability of people to connect with one another. And we're having a conversation about the technical advances. So the technical advances in and of themselves are not the problem. The problem is how and why these things are being created um, and being presented in ways that we need to be critical and we need to actually call for um, better communication, right? Oh, can you hold? Can you hold on for the microphone, just because we're doing this for the recording as well? Thank you. Uh, I think the main issue with deepfake is that it's it can be real time compared to maybe CGI in movies. So the the like testability of the or it, it gives it more more credit. Yeah. So uh, the problem with deepfakes, uh, more credit and in more hands. I think the challenge that we're having, I mean, because this is an AI and gender talk, right? The challenge that we're having of how um, revenge porn, for example, might be done with deepfakes is, is very real. Um, and it will be um, quite damaging to people to have certain kinds of information circulating about them that is fake. Um, 
yeah, the, I mean, it doesn't change the, the underlying scope of the argument that it's the scope and scale and speed of these technologies that's challenging our social capacity for managing them. We don't have trusted information environments right now. And that's one of the panics that's fueling a deep fake panic, right? We know we've got a lot of junk news circulating on our social media platforms. And yet more and more young people are getting, they get their information from social media. So we have this tension, right? We have a tension between the sources of where we want to turn to for our information and the ability of those platforms to be able to address those problems and challenges. So we need to come up with new kinds of ways that we're thinking about the governance of our information space. And that's bigger than just the deep fake conversation, I think. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Marcel Kraus. I work for the research funding organization, technology agency. And I would like to ask if you have some maybe example from other research funders, how they can tackle or how, how they can support these changes. Uh, what, what are their responsibilities for social justice, gender equality? Thank you. We need more empirical research now. That's my, that's my call to action. And we need global, comparative, on the ground research at the intersection between society and technology. How do AI tools change how work teams communicate? We have no idea. And yet that the tools are being rolled out right now. How do AI-enabled sentencing programs change judges' opinions? Does the display of the information on the dashboard between high, medium, and low risk versus a number like 67 versus 98, does that change how a judge sentences in, when faced with AI-enabled sentencing software? We don't know. We don't, the study hasn't been done. So there are simply these kinds of tools and tests that we need to put in place. Um, collaborators of mine at Stanford just published a paper on what they call AI mediated communication. So just as we know, we've had, um, you know, loads of experience thinking about how people understand or, or misunderstand um, television messages, how they understand or misunderstand um, propaganda in newspapers, um, how political information, how they respond to it. We can do those sorts of tests. So for example, they showed a set of um, Airbnb host profiles that they had created. And they said, of these host profiles to, to people in experimental settings, how many of these pro host profiles, how many do you trust? And they got a baseline answer. And then they went back and they said, okay, half of these were written by AI. Now who do you trust? The trust plummeted. So we know that when you introduce the idea of AI into a, into a system with other human, with humans, that people don't know who it is they trust. A very small experimental setting sliver of the kinds of work we need to do now. So my own work, I'm looking at cross-country comparisons in healthcare settings. How are healthcare workers managing the change and transition to having AI-enabled tools? And what is that doing to skill, to expertise, and to communication? And it's those kinds of cross-national comparative studies that I think will help us better understand what we can do about the society at the interface of the technical infrastructure. Okay, I would like to be the last person who asked the question. Uh, one of the reasons or one of the factors that fueled our wish to hold this discussion is the quite uh, funny stories about how women are overlooked in certain apps. Whether we mention um, an app that can uh, trace your uh, health and will manage to 
measure all kinds of things in your body, like your bilirubin level or whatever, but simply forgot to offer the function uh, of period tracker because the uh, designers simply forgot that females have periods. Or I could mention many other stories. Um, so what do you personally see as the most dangerous gender data gap that manifests itself in these ways? Yeah, I would I would have to say I think our healthcare data um, may be our most dangerous gender gap. So take, for instance, the studies that are published in the established medical literature. There are several um, AI-based um, tools that are being built on drawing from established studies. And yet we know that women are less likely to appear in those studies. We know that people who live far from hospitals, research hospitals, are less likely to appear in the research literature. So we know that we have these gaps in the published information and data that's available for creating training sets. Um, I would say another kind of uh, dangerous gender gap is this hubris, this kind of um, attitude that the that technology can always solve a solve the problem. So um, I was in a uh, I was in a in a conference with some Silicon Valley digital health innovators, and they said, you know, if we don't have access to our full genome sequencing, we'll never get to great healthcare. And I was like, well, actually, I don't know. For most of the world. Knowing that you have a genetic variation is not actually what's going to make you healthier. For most of the world, we need very different kinds of health interventions. And so I think it's the, the two things, the difference in the data and in the attitude that if it's, if it's a problem, there must be a technical solution. And frankly, that's simply not the case. Okay, so I would like to... Uh, thank all of you for uh, coming here today, and I would like to thank to Gina for accepting our invitation. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, lecture and discussion as well. Then I would like to mention our social media of Enkatsa Gendra Vida. You may find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you also may read uh, our monthly newsletters to which you can subscribe. And uh, the last thing I would like to point out is that if there are any people who came late and didn't manage to write your name in the presence list, please do so. So I will ask you kindly for an applause for Gina. And thank you very much for coming.